again. Good morning. Good morning. We have done it. We have reached the end of the series, Move. We've been here, I think, nine weeks. I think I lost count a couple weeks ago. We're nine weeks into this series studying uh, the early church in the book of Acts. We've talked about everything from how the, the church was powered by the Holy Spirit, from the purpose that it had when it went out, all the different challenges it had, the different people who were a key part of that church, and talked about the persecution and the challenges that they faced, how they overcame them. And in all of that, it's not just history, but it is lessons and strategies that we can find with the power of the Spirit to join in that movement. How many of you have ever said or had said about you that you were on a mission to do something? Anybody? <laughs> I love people point at their spouses. I love that, right? Uh, my, people always, I, I worked in retail for a little while, loss prevention, assets protection, and I gained in that time what they call the retail walk, which when I'm in a store, I don't meander, I don't peruse, I walk in the store, I walk to where I'm going, I pick up what I need, and I get out, and Lord help anybody who gets in my way, or children who try to slow me down, or derail me, right? I'm on a mission to get something, and here's an interesting thing I noticed about myself, when I was thinking about this sermon this week, and I went to the grocery store to pick up a couple things, I, wasn't, I was in a store I wasn't familiar with the layout. I went to somebody and said, do you know where this is? You know the last time I asked anybody for directions for anything in my life? No, I don't, right? But yet when we're on a mission, we're willing to ask questions. It's no longer about our ego or our pride or us making sure we know it. The mission is more important. When we talk about somebody in the military, when somebody is on a mission, right, nothing gets in their way. Nothing is more important than accomplishing the task. And everything we've talked about in this series, we haven't yet talked about the mission of the church. Mission is very simply, to sum it all up, defined like this, a specific task with which a person or group is charged. Now, you can talk about a lot of things in leadership and in church. We talk about a purpose, right? Why we do what we do. We talked about that in the very first or second week of this series. Why do we do the things we do? One of the buzzwords for the last two decades in, in business and in ministry has been values, right? What are your core ideals? We did a series on this last year, right? What are the core things? Jesus is Lord. The non-negotiables about your faith or about your business or about the way you conduct things. You could talk about uh, vision statements, right? This is what we want to be. We want to be a church. We want to be a business that does this, 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 this way. But mission is different. Mission is all about what are you trying to do. You can do it in a Christian way. You can run a business and say, we're going to do this and we're going to treat people right. But at the end of the day, your mission is your goal. What is your, why do you exist? What's the purpose, not just the why, but what is the literal thing you are trying to accomplish? Right? If you own a, a construction business, you can do all things the right way, but at the end of the day, your job is what? To construct things. That is your mission, right? But in the church, the, our mission statement is kind of gets lost in the shuffle occasionally. And, and I'll tell you this, Jesus gave us three or four very clear missions. We're going to look at those today. What is it we are called to do? You already heard one of them in Acts earlier when Brian read scripture. But another one is found in John's gospel, in John 15. And we're going to break down this section. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John 15, beginning in verse 15 this morning. We're going to start there. This is what verse 15 says. Jesus is talking to his disciples at the Last Supper. I no longer call you servants or slaves in some translations because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. In other words, the mission that my father gave me, I have spelled out to you in words and an action. It says you are no longer slaves. Now this statement in light of Christ's death and resurrection has more weight. We heard from Paul talk about we're no longer slaves to the law. We're no longer slaves to other people. We're no longer subservient to other groups. We are friends with Jesus. And that word friends, the Greek word philos, where we get the word Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love, 
philos, this love, the brotherly love, deep devotion out of intimacy and caring for one another. Jesus says, I care so much about you. I want to collaborate with you. I want to work with you. I'm going to give you the tools and the direction you need to do that. Next verse in verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Sit with that a minute. Jesus saying to you, not just the disciples, but to you, I chose you, and I have appointed you. Now, when I was, uh, back in the day when I used to go on mission trips, we used to build a lot of wheelchair ramps. If you've been on mission trips, you've built wheelchair ramps, decks, things like that. One of the problems when you go to rural places and you go on these projects is there's typically only one lumber store. It's usually 84 lumber, and it's about 25 miles from wherever you are. Right? And it eats up an hour and a half to get there and get back. And if you're lucky, you get to go to the store and choose the lumber and buy the lumber yourself. But most of the time, whoever's running the project has ordered the materials to be delivered. And you show up and there's just a pile of wood. It's been sitting there for who knows how long. And I learned very quickly, with, especially in youth ministry, I couldn't say to a student or another person, hey, go get me a 2 by 4 Because first of all, they may not know what a 2 by 4 is. Right? Second of all, they're just going to grab one. And I guarantee you the one they're going to grab is warped and bent and splintered and everything else. And so I learned very quickly, the first thing I do when I get on a mission trip on, on a work site, if the wood is there, we break out into piles. Here's the wood that we have and what we're going to use it for. Because some two-by-fours are warped really badly. But you know what? There may be a couple sections that are perfect, and I can use those for shorter things. You may throw it away. I would say, no, I can find three pieces in here that I can use. Right? You may find a perfectly straight two-by-four and say, I don't want to cut that. I need that for a long piece for some other part of the project. We go through and we choose the pieces of wood. If you go to the store and buy lumber, what do you do? You pull a piece of wood up and you look and you make sure it's going to fit your purpose. Jesus says, I've chosen you. There's a purpose I have handpicked you for. You. Even with your flaws, even with your mistakes, even with your backstory, I've chosen you. And I have something I want you to do that nobody else in this world is equipped or prepared to do in the same way. We've been chosen and pulled out by God to say, would you open yourselves up? I know you can't imagine ever doing this. You can't imagine being a part of this. But I'm going to tell you right now, God has an imagination that is dwarfed anything you or I have. He sees you and me. He sees you. He says, that's a piece of gold. That's somebody made in my image who has a purpose, who has a mission that nobody else has, that has a role that nobody else can play. He's chosen you for a purpose and for a mission. And you might ask the natural question, what is the mission? Well, Jesus continues, I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So the first mission that Jesus gives us is to go and produce lasting fruit. Go and produce, la not just fruit, but lasting fruit. How many of you know anything about peach trees? Anybody? A few, right? You grow up in the South, you learn about peach trees. This is the life stages of a peach tree. Dormant, swollen bud, buds the burst, green cluster, flowers bloom, fruit set. Three to four years from dormant to the first fruit. If you do if really good care of it, maybe two years. Three to four years of development. And then guess what? Every year, after the season is over and the plant goes back to dormant, it takes three to four months of growth from, the, from when the flowers spurt to when you get peaches again. And you know what happens if you get one of those late Easter freezes in March, early April? The crop is devastated. Because if you want to produce lasting fruit, you have to feed it, you have to nurture it, you have to trust it. Do you ever see a peach tree by itself? No, because what do peach trees need? Other peach trees, cross-pollination. You and I need other church, other Christians. We can't live in a vacuum, in a silo by ourselves. But you also have to protect the plant. You have to guard it, guard your heart. Guard the things against the things that are trying to corrupt it, that are trying to put an end to that peach tree. 
even year to year, every time, even though you've produced great fruit, the next cycle that comes around, you've got to start over again. You've got to do all the same work again and again and again. These are spiritual disciplines in the church. Things like continually being in prayer, in fellowship, being in conversation with God, listening to God, reading the scriptures. Right? Those things do all, they feed us, they nurture us, they protect us. And if you want to grow lasting fruit, you have to continue to keep in mind that life cycle because it applies to our faith as well. You see, producing fruit is living in such a way, living in such a way that your very presence in front of others, around others, brings love and peace and joy. The light of Christ shines so brightly through you that everybody around you who doesn't know you is compelled to ask, why are you like this? Why are you so steady? Why are you so full of hope? Why are you so full of love, even the people who treat you like garbage? Why do you think about things in a different way? Why do you see people, you don't ever see bad in people? And when they ask you why, and you're willing to say, Jesus, because of what Jesus did for me, let me tell you about my relationship. That's a way to producing fruit. All of those love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, those fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, your life is living those out. You're so reflecting Jesus that people can't help but be drawn to you. That's how we produce lasting fruit. Our first mission, our second mission is found in verse 17 of John 15 where we were. Very simple. This is my command, Jesus says, love one another. Love one another. Not just be friends, not just be kind, not just put a smile on and even though you're mad at somebody, you just not smile and nod and say, God bless you. Right? Love one another, agape, selfless, sacrificial love. The same love that Jesus demonstrated for you. If you've got your Bibles, look earlier in John 15. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Jesus went to the cross. We're going to celebrate communion in just a few minutes. His body broken, his blood shed for you. That's the love we're called to show one another. Love one another. When our mission is to love, when it comes to other people, no matter who they are, we don't prevaricate, we don't hesitate, we don't hedge, we don't hem and haw, we don't make it conditional, we simply love. We simply love. It takes work to get to that point. It takes practice to get to that point. It's not easy. But if we want to love in the same way Jesus did, there's only one way to do it, and it's practice it. Practice it. Stop. When you hear that inner thought that says, that person, did it, stop. No, that person is an image of God. That person is a child of God. See them the way God sees them. Love them. And keep practicing until it's no longer a decision, but a subconscious practice that invades everything you do. This is my command. Love one another. So produce lasting fruit. Love one another. And then our third command, we're going to go back to Acts uh, chapter 1 that Brian read earlier. Acts 1, verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it is not for you to know times or dates. The father has set by his own authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And here's the mission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So our third mission is to be Jesus' witnesses everywhere. Not just in church, not just in your home, but everywhere. The best way to think about this is imagine the scripture you just heard read. Being one of Jesus' disciples, Jewish followers of Jesus in the first century, hearing what Jesus is saying. The checklist, right? First century Jewish disciples. 
take my witness to Jerusalem. Where are they having this conversation? Anybody remember? In Jerusalem. Right? Great, Jesus. This is the spiritual home of my people. I look around. If you've been there, it's a beautiful city. It's a wonderful place. I'm already here. Maybe I'm even already doing that. Don't you love when somebody gives you a task and you can already check one off before you ever start? Right? Great, I can do that. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem. We've checked that. Be my witnesses in Judea. Well, that's a little more difficult. It's a little more spread out. There's a lot of rugged travel involved, but these disciples, they've been doing that for three years. They know the area. They know Judea. I might get to see my family when I go to Galilee. I might get to see the places I've grown up. Those are my people. Yeah, it might be a challenge, but those are my people. I can do that, Jesus. Judea and Samaria. Oh, ho, 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 ho. hold on. Who did the Jewish folks in the first century in Israel dislike more than maybe anybody else? The Samaritans, their cousins, right? Their cousins, their Jewish cousins who had a different set of beliefs about the way they practiced. I ain't doing that, Jesus. I'm a McCoy, they're a Hatfield. I ain't playing that game. We're not allowed to go there. They vote red, I vote blue. I can't do that. They're too different from me. They live on the other side of the tracks. I don't want any part of going there and talking to them. Besides, they're mean. They're nasty. They've been bad, mean to my people, never minding that I've also been mean to them. Right? I can't do that. I can't be in life with them. I can't be in relationship with them. Even though we share a deep background, we share languages, we share some of our traditions, those lines, those walls have been built in concrete, and I'm not broaching those walls. No way. No way. Even though Jesus, in John's gospel, goes to Samaria and goes to a Samaritan woman and breaks that wall down. Their walls of defense would have been up when he said Samaritans. So we're not going there. And then to the ends of the earth. You know what they would have said to the ends of the earth? Why does it matter? They're not Jewish. They're Gentiles. They're not people of the book. They're not people of God. I could preach them until my, my tongue falls off. They're not going to be eligible. There's no point. It's worthless. Right? They have no chance. Why would I waste my breath, my time, my energy? Right? Those non-Jewish Gentiles in Rome, in Athens, in Africa, wherever they might go to the ends of the earth, they have no chance. It's not worth my time. They're a lost cause. Surely Jesus didn't mean those Gentiles. The Samaritans maybe. If they come around to my way of thinking, we could work with that. But those Gentiles, no way. Absolutely not. They're beyond all hope. They would never be saved. They can't be. They're not Jewish. Right? Grace covers a lot of stuff, Jesus, but it doesn't cover them. That's what they would have been thinking. But then Pentecost happened. Right after this conversation, Acts 1, Pentecost happened. Here's what that scripture says, if you don't remember, Acts 2. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking, the disciples, Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? They were so reflecting God that people couldn't help but think this is a work of God. What does this mean? What's changed? What's different? But instead of being open to being a part of the movement, what's the question that happens? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they're drunk. That's the only explanation. They can't be the God. It's just that they've had too much wine. Right? And then after that happens, Peter gives that masterful sermon inspired by the Spirit. 3,000 people come to Jesus. The church begins to move and to be launched, to go to be witnesses. But, and it's all rosy. Do you all ever have a, a honeymoon moment in your marriage? Right? I know you're all still in your honeymoon phases. I know that. We have that moment where, like, you've made the right decision. You've done the right... I, I can't help but spend more time with this person. 
I want to get married. I want to have a family. I want to do all these great things. And then life happens. Challenges happen. Maybe not in a marriage, but in a relationship or in a church. When a new ministry starts, you have an oasis retreat where you have a spiritual high. I can't wait to do more with God. And then life happens. And you fall off that spiritual high. And you begin to wonder what's going on. That's what happens to the church. They're on fire for Jesus in the very early days. They're sitting around a table. They're sharing resources. They're sharing meals. And then the persecution begins. From the Sanhedrin, from the Pharisees, from Saul himself coming to put these people in jail because how dare they speak of this Jesus that we thought we'd finished off. But then Paul has his moment with Jesus on the Damascus Road. He becomes from the most avid persecutor of the church to the most avid advocate for the church. Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch on the road who would never have been considered as a follower of Jesus, ineligible. And the eunuch, one of the most beautiful lines in all the scripture, says, why can't I be baptized? Philip says, you know what? There's no reason you can't be. And he baptizes the eunuch. And then Peter has his encounter, we talked about last week with God, where the, the food comes down and God says, kill and eat. This devout Jewish follower says, I can't do that. And God says, don't you dare call unclean what I have called clean. And he meets Cornelius and the spirit comes and the spirit descends not just on the Jewish followers, but on the Gentile Romans. And those walls that have been so carefully maintained have been blown apart. And the church begins to go out on mission. Paul begins his journeys to Rome, to Athens, to Asia Minor, all over the Mediterranean. Others do as well. The church begins to explode even in the face of persecution, in the face of trials, in the face of death. Having to meet in secret, the church explodes. Why? Because they were A, powered by the Holy Spirit, but also because they were so focused on this mission. They were so dead set on what they had to do to go be the witnesses for Jesus everywhere they went that they no longer cared about death. They no longer cared about the things that might get in their way. They no longer cared about their egos or self-preservation. They were so laser-focused on this mission to be Jesus' witnesses that nothing could stop them. Nothing could stop them. It's no longer about keeping the good news pent up among a chosen people, but about making sure that everybody knew who Jesus was. Nothing was going to stop them. Now you might ask, how do we bear witness? How do we bear witness to Jesus? Now, many people, when they hear witness or evangelize, they get tense, right? They think about college Bible preachers on the corner, thumping Bibles, screaming, holding up placards, all that kind of stuff, right? That's not what bearing witness is. You know how we bear witness to Jesus? Pay attention. Listen close. We bear fruit and we love one another. That's how we bear witness. When we bear fruit, when we do the first mission, we bear fruit for Jesus in our own lives. When we do the second mission and we love one another, we are then bearing witness to Jesus. Not just in our words, but in our deeds and in our very lives, we're bearing witness to the crucified and resurrected Jesus. Our whole life begins to tell the story. My favorite hymn in the entire hymnal of our United Methodist hymnal is I love to tell the story. For those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to know it like the rest. We never get tired of it. We never get tired of living it. We never get tired of sharing it with our whole being. This whole series has been about what does it mean to be on the move for Jesus? What does it mean to be on the move with the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to go forward and let the Spirit guide us and lead us? But if we don't know our mission, that gets lost. other stuff gets lost in the weeds. Our mission is to bear fruit, to love one another, and to be witnesses for Jesus. Not just in church, not just on Sundays, but everywhere we go with every fiber of our being. Friends, the Holy Spirit is alive and well. The Spirit is moving in this place and all over the world. Do you want to be on the move with the Spirit? Do you want to be a part of that movement? Do you want to join the Holy Spirit, not just say yes and amen in church, but with every breath you take, every word you speak, every action you make? 
that our entire being, our entire mission would be to be wrapped up in this movement of God. To be witnesses to the world that Jesus is Lord. Money is not Lord. Nobody else is Lord. Nothing else is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that his love has so transformed us, has so changed our lives and our hearts that we can't help but be on the move. That we can't help but not be distracted, to keep ourselves from being distracted. We can't help but say yes when opportunities come to tell people why we live the way we live. Do you want to be on the move with the Spirit? Do you want to be on mission with the Spirit? Do you want to be a part of the greatest movement the world has ever known? Amen? Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, you've poured out your spirit in so many ways, in so many places, transformed lives, transformed families, transformed communities, and transformed the world. The work is not done. The work continues. Harvest is plenty. The world that is full of chaos and division and anger and hatred and killing, violence, desperately needs the love of Christ. Desperately needs your spirit. People who are clamoring clamoring for it all over the world, even if they don't have the words, God, be in our souls and fire us up and energize us and power us and help us to have the courage to be your witnesses. Not just among those who we know agree with us. Not just among those with whom we are comfortable. But everywhere we go, that our lives would so reflect Jesus. 24 hours a day. That people can't help but be drawn to us, not for our sake, but for the sake of the gospel. Strengthen us, embolden us, and be in our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.